Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane and I'm here today with Felix Lutsch, who's joining me today as a guest host. So we're going to speak about lots of different topics today. Uh, maybe brief about Felix. So Felix, I've been working with Felix for many years now, uh, over four years at, uh, at Chorus One. So he joined us about four years ago as a research analyst, and now he's the chief commercial officer of Chorus One. He's super knowledgeable about lots of crypto stuff, including staking industry and other things. And today we're going to have, you know, a bit of a, a discussion just where we talk about, uh, we sort of try to answer the question of like, you know, what's interesting in crypto right now? And, you know, we, we have a bunch of topics that we want to cover, like things around, you know, decentralization, proof of stake, uh, interoperability, uh, crypto markets. Felix is going to tell us the crypto prices uh, at the end of the year. So you can make your trades based on that. But before we, uh, before we go into that, we feel about our sponsors. So first of all, well, very fitting, course one. So, you know, if, if your crypto assets are sitting around idly, you're losing out. Uh, so you can start earning rewards, contribute to network security by staking with course one. And we are securing billions of dollars on over 25 different networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Uh, course one also works with many institutions to run, you know, white label nodes, uh, providing, you know, a high availability, very secure and uh, compliant service. So you can directly participate in decentralized networks. So you can go over to course.1 course and start your staking journey. Uh, also hiring people. So if you're interested in starting a career in the world of crypto and staking, make sure to check out the open positions there. And then Paraswap. So Paraswap is a multi-chain DEX aggregator. So that means through Paraswap, you can easily access the liquidity of various different decentralized exchanges. They automatically find you the cheapest liquidity so you can trade knowing that you get it the best price. It's also very gas friendly and helps you keep your transaction costs low. They have expanded to various different networks, including Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, Phantom. And you can also use Paraswap from directly within the Ledger Live application. And they've become a DAO. So if you have PSP token or you want to get some PSP token, you can uh, participate, tell them what to do. So yeah, and they have a gas refund program even better. So go to paraswap.io slash epsvenner to check it out. And so with that, let's, uh, yeah, let's get into our, let's get into our episode. First of all, how are you doing? And uh, welcome. Hey, Brian. So great to be here and be on the kind of guest side of a podcast for a change. Um, I guess you already introduced me. So not much to add and uh, looking forward to the discussion today and uh, talking to you outside of work about crypto, my favorite hobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I gave brief, I gave some intro, but maybe, maybe it would be nice if you can sort of give your, your own life story. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. No, yeah. So um, I started out basically getting interested in crypto when I was studying. I studied finance in Germany. And I just realized more or less that I didn't want to join a bank or become one of the big four companies. And I uh, learned about uh, crypto through kind of the internet, just being an active internet lurker. And um, I learned about Augur initially, kind of trying to write my master, th master thesis about prediction markets on, and Augur. But then obviously Augur wasn't like ready at that time. So I wrote about like kind of another blockchain topic. Uh, ultimately kind of also made the decision to work in the crypto industry. Um, luckily found the Chorus One ad on AngelList. Now we have positions again on AngelList if you want to check it out. But yeah, found the ad there. It was like super fitting to my background. Uh, one of the, I guess, uh, kind of rare at that time to have a role that wasn't like super developer focused. And uh, yeah, just was super interested in proof of stake. And now, and started as a research analyst, as Brian said, um, been kind of trying to make staking um, yeah, like understandable for people. I uh, initially wrote a lot of content, uh, stake economy newsletter, maybe some people read that, um, and kind of did work on more and more things in 
Chorus One, ultimately also like business development and uh, just kind of th things on the business commercial side. Um, now for over four years, as Brian said, and um, yeah, that's that's basically it. So I'm here today. I've been looking at a lot of different networks, a lot of things that have happened in crypto uh, through the bear market and now the start of the bull market or wherever we are right now. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's the background. Cool. Well, yeah, proof of stake. Let's talk about proof of stake. I mean, I guess we've, we've spoken about proof of stake many times, mostly from the perspective of speaking with you know, proof of stake networks. I think that has been probably the most, uh, you know, the dominant way that we have at, at Epicenter, right, have sort of addressed the topic. Uh, I guess there's also been, I mean, we did an episode about Lido once, right? So we've covered like liquid staking a little bit, not too much. I guess bison trails we had at one point on as well. So maybe there's a bunch of different, but you know, proof of stake has basically gone from a concept. I mean, I remember we had Vitalik on, you know, 2015 or something talking about how Ethereum was gonna switch to proof of stake, right? So like the notion of proof of stake has been around for a long time, but now it's become something different, right? Where it's actually like an industry. So what's going on today in your view? What, what are the most important uh, sort of evolutions in the staking landscape. Yeah, I think one thing that has been a topic since I started in blockchain or crypto and probably even longer was this idea that the institutions are coming. Uh, <laughs> I guess they are still coming uh, slowly, but surely. And I, I think it's, it's, it's also reflected in the staking industry and the landscape where essentially... Yeah, the, the industry has matured a lot over the last three years from basically, I guess, game of stakes where most of the uh, validator operators started out or Tezos initially, right? Where there was like basically some people that were interested in this, in this technology and started to run these validators. No one even really knew what they're doing. And uh, in the meantime, like a lot of best practices developed and um, uh, just proof of stake networks grew a lot, uh, first of all, in number, but also uh, in terms of like market cap and kind of money to be made uh, from staking rewards and uh, commissions for the node operators. And I guess in general, the concept then became widely understood in the kind of broader market. And because of its nature of like relatively easy to understand and like relatively risk-free yield in, in the proof of stake assets where that's, that's, I guess, an interesting field for institutional customers uh, and, and they have um, entered the, this field a lot. So I guess to, to, to say what that means is in the end that these customers have like different requirements in the end than maybe um, the stakers that started out in 2018, 19 to stake where they would yeah basically just delegate from their ledger or through MetaMask or, or whatever the wallet of their choices. And now th there is a whole like other process involved in due diligence and compliance for, for these players um, to, yeah. And uh, the node operators that want to work with these uh, clients that are on the institutional side, they need to adhere to their kind of, or to these rules in, in a way. I mean, I guess we can get into that a bit, Brian. I, I'm, I'm sure you also have some some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, right? Because when I uh, when I became interested and involved in crypto it was twenty thirteen, and with sort of this Bitcoin, this Bitcoin uh, bubble started, uh, one of the first ones, and even then, one of the main stories that there was was all oh, the institutions are like coming and it's like imminent and they're gonna like, and of course there were some examples then, right? Yeah, like overstock starting to accept you know bitcoin as payments and of course it in the end well now we're here many years later right nine years later almost eight and a half years later or something and yeah it's still a slow still a slow process but i i think you're very much right that there is actually I mean, if you think about, you know, what do institutions do with crypto? I guess the first thing is sort of the easiest thing is like, okay, Bitcoin, right? You can just hold Bitcoin. 
I think that's that's kind of like the the, the first thing you can do, and, and of course, hold the, that is also something that we've we've seen happening, you know, for years. And, you know, maybe some, some corporations holding it on the balance sheet, custody, right, being a huge topic. And again, the custodians have generally been like, okay, first of all, you know, let's let's allow people to just hold Bitcoin or something, maybe hold some others, maybe enable like trading a little bit. But then if you go like beyond that, you know, staking is very attractive, I think, because it's, yeah, it's easy to understand, right? It's, it's low risk. It's this, you know, it feels like a bond, right? With some safe interest rate. It's quite different from DeFi, right? Also DeFi moves so quickly, right? The DeFi, you have something here and then next month it's gone and something over here. And I think that's like very, and, and from a regulatory perspective also seems probably like uh, more of a mess. So I think staking is is probably or is one of the ways that institutions kind of get into it. But of course, it's still very slow. The, o- the other thing I think that stands out to me the most is sort of like one of the, the themes, I think, when it comes to staking is, is just the increase in complexity. I mean, you mentioned this from different types of customers, right? And compliance is like an interesting topic. So we, at course, one way right, we've been doing uh, a lot a lot of work on compliance and it is huge amount of work right to to basically then you know measure up to some of these institutional standards and comes with a lot of implications so that's those are some things but then there are other things too that have brought like more complexity to the val- to, to staking and the validated role you know one is just the the diversity in different roles right so we have um the kind of normal validator role of, you know, you're checking the validity of the transactions, creating the block, checking the other blocks, prop- propagating in the P2P network and kind of, you know, creating those blocks, right? But then, I mean, already uh, there's been other roles like, you know, oracles and, uh, and, and new ones coming up. How, how do you think this, what do you think the impact of that is going to be? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I guess we started out like originally, like a long time. I think there were a lot of roles that people or protocol designers thought of for crypto economic protocols. A lot of them actually never came about or um, maybe maybe didn't like take off as, as planned. Like for example, the Polkadot Fisherman, it was for a long time a thing. I don't know if this is actually even implemented or how, how these work, but in general, right? Um, People get creative with the, the the things that the node needs to do to make the network work. And um, in the end, I guess as, as more applications also, like if, if we think about the networks as this base layer where applications run on and then um, more value is, is just on this chain, these, these roles become actually, yeah, quite important. And it, there's more com- competition, I guess, around fulfilling whatever this role is designed to do. So. I guess in the validator sense, normally you, you're just looking at your your uptime usually. And I mean, that's also not the easiest thing. So it depends on the network, right? The networks nowadays actually also increase in uh, demand for um, hardware. So for example, on Osmosis, right? You there There's a lot of computation happening at the epoch boundary that needs like more servers or better servers. Um, and I guess there's more state needs to be safe, but... Um, then there's also another dimension where for some of these roles, uh, there's also like a certain optimization needed. And I guess, yeah, what, what, we're, what we're conceptually thinking is probably that this optimization obviously will, like some people will be better suited to, to kind of fulfill or optimize these, these, for these roles. And then they will basically take on a lot of the market share of, of, of these roles. So like, if it's like a competitive market, probably like only a few players will be suited to, to do that. Um, some of the examples that come, come to mind, of course, maybe like familiar for people in the DeFi space is, is liquidations where essentially, um, yeah, there is some loan at risk. If the price moves now, the f- person that is the f- fastest to, um, um, kind of get that uh, transaction, the liquidation transaction in will, will make the money. So obviously there are parties that probably better suited to do that than the average um, 
yeah, a token holder that, that wants to participate in this. Um, so I guess that that complexity, I mean, I mean, um, yeah, makes it kind of harder for smaller players maybe to to compete in a way. I guess, Brian, I don't know what what's your. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it also sort of brings up this other topic, right, that's become, uh, you know, one of the most talked about in crypto. It's also something that we've been bringing up, you know, guests various times and, you know, like people are thinking about it a lot, this topic of MEV. And, you know, I think anyone we have on the podcast that's like you're building uh, a crypto network thinks about this. And I mean, what is MEV, right? We've also done some podcasts about it, but MEV is basically around the the ability of the block producer to, you know, decide on the order of transactions. Although I guess the term is sort of used in different ways that sometimes also includes, you know, people who are not actually the block producer, right? So when you, uh, in Ethereum, often they would talk to them as, as searchers, right? So the people who basically look for some kind of opportunities to like reorganize the transactions or put in particular transactions to to make money. And then, it, of course, if you, if you think of these roles as well, now, let's say there's some crypto economic uh, mechanism and expects some transaction. And for somebody who like puts in that transaction, they can earn some money. Then, of course, if you are the block producer, then you can basically, you know, you have to monopoly, right? You can say, like, you can say, like, I'm going to put my transaction uh, first, right? And and if there's that money to be made, you can make that money. You know, examples of that are, like, let's say liquidation, right? On Maker, uh, you can have some CDP or basically somebody borrowed money, you know, put up collateral, the collateral drops in value and somebody can liquidate it and, and earn something. And then whoever does that first, right, basically gets like free money. And then of course, if the validator or the miner, right, at the moment, but the validator in proof of stake networks, you know, has the ability to, to do that, but has the ability to do that does require like understanding, you know, the contents of the block, analyzing those things, maybe analyzing the transactions that are coming in, then, you know, executing that in some kind of real-time fashion. So it's like pretty complex and something that, who does that today? It's, it's, I think, probably just in like small amounts it's being done. But if you think, I think of the future of staking, right, this is going to become like a very big thing. And of course, you then have also the counter trend that, uh, and I guess that's where MEV is very, you know, controversial. And people say, oh, but um, maybe that's bad for the network. Um, sometimes it can be good for the network or bad for the network. But at least it's something that then also protocol designers, or application designers, you know, try to deal with in different ways. I mean, for example, right, we've had uh, cow swap on here before, right? Or I think, uh, and and there. Uh, the Twitter handle, at least, is MEV protection. I don't actually understand, or, or like, but so you know, specific decks developed around that. So, but I think that entire thing is is just a huge topic that's gonna uh, you know be something that will give work for many different parties for you know like many many years and. You know, the outcomes kind of who knows where it, where it all heads. Yeah, I guess like from from the node operator perspective, in terms of you you're kind of forced to deal with this topic in a way, because yeah, most people realize that this is big because we saw it on Ethereum. We we know there is definitely a market already and, and it will probably grow. Uh, of course, there's also people building tools to like make it more accessible, maybe to smaller node operators. So I guess from from the perspective of uh, who is well suited to do that, maybe there is some scenario where the node operator can work with the searches through some tool and still have the same opportunity as like a bigger operator. But still, um, just in terms of like it, it's one of these things where that you have to think about as a node operator. So it's not just about you know keeping your server up. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that that go into being um, operating these nodes and 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 
at, at scale especially. Uh, so I guess our one of the topics we wanted to discuss when Ryan and me talked earlier, what we want to discuss is kind of this this idea of uh, yeah decentralization. What what are kind of forces that help it, that hamper, temper it? And I guess MEV seems as one that probably is a centralizing force in a way. I think we we also just came up with a few other things, or I guess we could discuss some other um, um, yeah things that maybe increase or decrease centralization. Brian, you. What are just like things that you, so we, I guess we mentioned compliance, we mentioned MEV. Um, do you have other things that come to mind? I mean, there's definitely uh, various things that I think are driving towards uh, the increase in complexity of validation and then increase. Uh, and of course, that means that if you can invest more in it, you know, you can provide the better product and you can get more customers and you can become bigger, right? So like you have those kind of dynamics. I think they're there. Of course, you also have other dynamics. I mean, you know, one thing is just that, you know, when we started with course one, right? We didn't like, there was not really like a template for how to do it, right? So there was, it was a lot of work to figure out how to run a validator, but today Mm, there's lots of open source tools, like lots of guides, right? Like, so that, so that I think that barrier, the initial barrier to just, you know, have a validator run on the network has gone down, you know, a lot, right? I mean, I think in Cosmos, for example, it's like very easy to do it. You know, that's one thing. Yeah, I guess there's liquid staking too. Uh, liquid staking can be sort of like decentralizing and centralizing in, in different ways, right? So you can have, let's say if you have something like uh, Lido as an example, right? You can have on the one hand, uh, it, it distributes the stake to many uh, node operators. So that's kind of more decentralized, right? Then what would you have as a normal outcome? But then at the same time, more control gets shifted to, you know, like the governance of that governance token and so you can have sort of like a, a, some some degree of centralization again at there, and so that's that's also interesting, you know, that interplay. Yeah, I I, I found this always very very interesting, and I guess we saw the staking mechanisms shift a lot since kind of staking came around, right? Like I guess early um, Cosmos and Tezos started with this model of delegation. So you're actually able as a token holder to stake, even though you don't run the nodes, which enabled like all this, these businesses that now run nodes for others. Um, and, and then I guess Ethereum kind of made a shift from that again, where it's like, oh, you have to hold the ETH yourself to validate. But then of course, uh, someone came around and realized there's an opportunity to build like a delegation protocol as a smart contract, which, which is essentially Lido and, and give that liquid staking dimension to it, which even makes it more attractive than the native staking. So I think from my perspective, what this is also like, I guess if we're thinking about protocol designers, designing their protocol to minimize MEV, I think they should probably also think about designing the protocol to minimize like having other protocols take like share from their core mechanism, which in, in this case, I guess is staking where now it shifts to Lido, as you said, right? The governance is now with Lido instead of the protocol itself and maybe it would would make more sense I, I mean i don't know actually if that's true but that's kind of like what i was thinking that maybe if you have this kind of natively in the protocol that the stake is already liquid then i guess you're taking a little bit that opportunity away from someone to make like a drastically better staking model than, than yours i would actually be curious to hear brian what, what do you think about about that you mean you mean because if you have an outcome where you then have like let's say Lido, which controls a lot of the stake, that then Lido is in a strong position to basically, uh, you know, extract MEV, and that's kind of your point. Yeah, yeah, just that, or also like distribute the stake how Lido want, and maybe, maybe it would have been yeah like better that the, the from the start we have like a protocol that. Uh, is like liquid staking. I, I think one one of them that now comes around slowly to it, I guess, is Cosmos, where there will be these delegation voucher ish uh, design, where now you can tokenize your delegation um, on the on the hub, or you will be able to, and then 
that can be used uh, in, in different composable ways. So that's kind of like natively built into the protocol instead of having a separate um, thing. Uh, and I, I think that's a pretty pretty good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing that's like interesting sort of like on this point is this, uh, you know, like you raise it a little. So like I, on Cosmos, right? Like so anybody can like spin up a validator and you have to have like whatever one atom or uh, you know one token in whatever the the coin is and and then people can stake with you and you don't have to have capital right now tezos was already kind of different there right because tezos required the the validator or they call the baker to have uh, 20 percent of the of what other people stake with you in their own wallet right so now if i'm like some random guy who wants to start like a Tezos Baker, well, that's kind of creates a big barrier because if I don't have the Tezis myself, like I have to go and like figure out some way to get Tezis before people can actually stake with me. So like, I guess the idea of Tezos was that there would be some sort of, you know, skin in the game for them and maybe higher security, but I don't think that played out like that, right? So I think in, it, it pro- Practically speaking, there's not, never been an issue, let's say, on the Cosmos networks that, you know, validators don't have their own stake uh, up, right? Because first of all, there's not really any attacks they can do that will give them money and their reputation so key. So if they did anything, then people will just like go elsewhere. And so I think, it, but, the, but the effect has been, right, that then the, the validators or the bakers have to... You know, have a lot of extra work, may have to find whales, uh, create legal contracts. Uh, actually, we, we have kind of dealt with that. And, and and I think in the end, it has it creates a barrier to entry and it's a, kind of like a centralizing thing. And of course, Ethereum, I mean, Ethereum, I guess that's, there was like, an, um, so one guy we were in touch with quite a bit in the beginning, Cosmos, right? Because he was running uh, a Cosmos validator at the Game of Saves and at the launch is Ryan Adams, who of course has become, you know, has done like fantastic work with Bankless and, and created like, you know, really great podcast and media thing around mostly Ethereum and DeFi. But, you know, he was making this tweet recently of like, oh, you know, Cosmos uh, staking is a cartel and too centralized. And it's interesting to compare that with like Ethereum, right? Because on Ethereum, of course, you again have this thing, as you said, right? Like, I mean, yes, it's easier, right? For me, as somebody who has, let's say, 32 ETH and I want to run my own validator, right? Like I can do that, right? Whereas in Cosmos, you know, the least validator may have like, let's say, 2 million or something like that of of Adam's uh, staked on the Cosmos hub, let's say. So, you know, the barrier to get in there is higher. But uh, from that perspective, but you have to have the capital, right? And and that's a huge, uh, it's a huge centralizing effect. Yeah, I guess on that, right? I, I mean, for one, in Cosmos also, the nice thing is there's many Cosmos chains, right? The idea is we have many networks and there's also like networks that have a lower barrier to entry where you can get started and start a validator and get familiar and make your reputation so I guess that's one point. And the other is also, right, as you said, you need the capital. So what I think happens is that, sure, there's probably more people that run like nodes on their own with their 32 ETH if they have that much, which is also like already, a, I guess, a pretty substantial amount. Um, and and then, but that's kind of like a very long tail um, of node operators uh, or like in terms of percent of general stake, I, I feel like that's a very small minor fraction it's probably not even very clear how much it is but i would assume it's less than 10 percent and will probably never be or probably less than five even um and so what is actually the impact of that is probably not that much and then on the other hand on the more extreme side is i guess you have more centralization because it's so hard to build this delegation model on ethereum that really only lido uh, as like a liquid staking protocol can do it and maybe like centralized exchanges can do it so uh, there's really like only like a few very big players that then get a lot of stake and probably in terms of 
kind of how many people it takes or entities it takes to reach that threshold of, of something going wrong. Like, I guess that's what you should optimize for in a way for the proof of stake network, right? That um, it's hard to attack the network and maybe distributing the entities. I, I would almost say that probably in, in terms of this Nakamoto co coefficient or however you want to call it, um, maybe the Cosmos design is actually doing better than Ethereum, at least right now. And, and um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of my view on it. Yeah, I mean, I think that seems pretty clear, right? I think if you add up like whatever Coinbase, Kraken and Binance or something, then I think you, you are going to be above a third for sure on Ethereum and, uh, and, and your cost. And also, I think one thing is like actually Ethereum hides a lot of it. Like you don't really, you have a lot much visibility what's going on, right? Because, and of course, that's also one of the nice things about the Cosmos model right? is that there is this aspect of like, I can look at the validators and I can, you know, there's like the, na the name and the website and you can like stake with them. So there's this, you know, in a way it's like this advertising board where like people can show up, people can not do something. And, uh, of course it's not so easy to get, uh, delegation, right? You have to stand out somehow, but much, much easier than to, I don't know, convince some some institution, I guess, to like, you know, basically, uh, you know, build some solution where you can, you can take the ETH. Yeah. I think that the upside of that is also like, now you have this, the validator has some kind of identity, right? There's a reputation, as you said, attached to it. There is all that. I think if you, if you get rid of that again, now all the validators are anonymous. So really they don't care about anything, maybe about, but the, yeah, their stake and, and and I guess that is also like maybe less secure, right? Because now with this reputation, if your thing is on the line, your your brand is there, you actually kind of increase the security, I guess, because you you have all that on the line. Where is if you're just like a string of numbers, like let's say on Avalanche, where right now if, if you run a node, really you just see like a, a string and you don't really know who that belongs to. So if they misbehave, uh you wouldn't really know who was it, and they could maybe like launch a new node again and get stake again and um, that that probably wouldn't happen on Cosmos like that, right? Although, like, I guess the flip side of that is that you know the if you look at like a Cosmos network, right? The the entities running that are basically identifiable. Right? Like, you can be, you know, you you can figure out at least for most of them. Okay, where are they? Who are they? You know, uh, where's that company? So I think in terms of you know, pressure from governments or, you know, maybe some regulatory crackdown, it may well be that the Ethereum model might be more resilient. Though I would say it's still probably for a government size actor, easy to identify the nodes. Yeah. So we talk a bit about liquid staking. Where, where do you think that's going? Yeah, I think it's still, I mean, we've been, it feels like a long time, but I guess even people that were really in this space is like only two years since people started like thinking about it and then probably like a bit more than a year that something is live. And, and I guess most of it is Lido, right? And Lido and Ethereum kind of being the poster child for liquid staking and a lot of things designed around that. I think there's been a bunch of innovation since then already. And I would obviously expect there to be a lot more innovation coming since, I mean, I guess liquid staking for me is also just like a extension of general staking design that kind of takes into account DeFi. Um, and yeah, right. Like we, we've seen a few things already, like some innovation, I guess we'll, we'll see more and we'll hopefully like have competitive market and see different models play out and, and uh, succeed. And, and probably it will... Um, yeah, definitely be, I mean, that's why I guess, of course, one, we are also like very interested in because it's like, it's also like uh, the, this trend, we, we have to kind of deal with it because it kind of changes the model. Like who is your customer now? Now you have this liquid staking protocol, I guess, as a customer, which two years ago didn't exist as, as your customer potentially. Um, yeah. And, and then these protocols can all have like different ways how they stake and you can probably yeah, as a node operator, you would like try to optimize to get in that set. I guess we talked about about Lido, how it works there, where it's more like a governance-based decision. 
And um, essentially, you need to like prove that you have you know, of your setup of um, kind of track record and, and send an application. And it's a bit more like that, the whole system. And then there's like some algorithmic solutions right now, I guess, like prim primarily like some some people that innovated there essentially was, I guess, originally the Solana Foundation itself with the their stake pool design that kind of tried to look at uptime and uh, different kind of objective measures to to um, decide where the stake is delegated and then marinate and uh, Socian, I think, kind of build off that and build like liquid staking protocol that does a similar thing. Um, now, sure, there's like more designs uh, to be explored there. And I, I mean, I'm just excited to, to see some of them. One that comes to mind, of course, where we have uh, explored is, is now uh, being implemented by Quicksilver, uh, kind of a spin-off, of course, one where um, they are building a system where essentially the holders of the of the liquid staking token can kind of signal their preference when they initially mint the staking token to which validator the stake should go to. And through that, basically, the the validator set is uh, formed. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's like a lot of other designs. One thing I, I could think of is also like maybe there could be something that just mirrors the um, existing validator set and the distribution there, or I mean, yeah, Lord knows what what's there. Um, I guess, yeah. What what's your thoughts, Brian? How do you expect this? It's a good question, right? Because I think at the same time, it, it, let's say I, I think uh, the thesis around liquid staking, I think, is also a little bit that you know you're gonna have. Uh, this liquid staking asset that's being created, let's say stake ETH. And, you know, the, the ambition of Lido, uh, and, and I think this is true for, you know, many proof of stake or many liquid staking protocols is that then this token actually becomes kind of, you know, the token that is used, right? So, you know, I hold stake ETH in my wallet, not ETH, you know, maybe you, you have uh, pools on AMMs that have like staked ETH pairs. It's used as maybe some sort of base token in DeFi applications. And of course that has a big benefit, right? Because then all those tokens, wherever they are, are basically, you know, like accruing uh, staking rewards. Uh, and, and, and then I think the, I would say the, the, the thesis is a little bit that then you have this, you know, sort of ossification, right? That becomes like the standard becomes like super hard to disrupt, becomes, you know, like, and it also winner takes all uh, dynamic potentially, uh, at least can work out like that, but I guess we'll see. But I, th I think there is, there's obviously a benefit to having, you know, a lot of liquidity accrue around a particular liquid staking asset. So it's interesting you know, sort of ask, you know, how, how much evolution uh, is there going to be, or is it something that kind of, you know, becomes sort of solidified and, and is then this like layer and then uh, other things are happening on top. I'm, yeah, I'm sort of, I guess I have a little bit uh, question if, does MEV change things fundamentally? Maybe not, right? Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's sort of like, let's say I hold stake ETH and then uh, on a, somewhere else, MEV happens and maybe it changes what my staking rewards are and, and what the validators do, but doesn't really change, you know, the ERC-20 I hold. So maybe it doesn't fundamentally change the liquid staking model or like, but but maybe, I don't know. So I, I think that's still kind of like an open question because I, I do think MEV is going to change a lot. And so I'm yeah, wondering if that's it's going to impact uh, you know, kind of bring new new models or leaking staking that maybe are uh, able to outcompete some of the existing ones. I think, yeah, for example, I guess now some of these liquid staking solutions look at the, the algorithmic ones at least try to like find the most performant validator, which often is just the one that has like 0% commission rate. So I think a lot of the algorithmic solutions on uh, Solana right now they basically delegate a lot to like low fee validators and that also like kind of obviously means that these um, the operators of these nodes actually don't really earn so like kind of the money uh, goes away from the node operators and I, I don't think that's 
in the long term a good idea in a way. But I mean, maybe if, if MEV is there, then they would pick nodes that do better on MEV. So it could again kind of um, lead to that because I guess if, if your liquid staking protocol really like your main product is the APY of your and the integrations, of course, which I guess mostly the, the goal of the integration is also to increase the APY of your the holders of the liquid staking asset. Um, so yeah, like, yeah, it remains in interesting to see. I think we are still very, very early. I think that's another, you know, another big trend, right? A big thing that's happening is just that, you know, interoperability is really, you know, really starting to happen, right? Cause there was, I think been work on this for, you know, a long time. We had early things like, what was it like the Bitco, you know, PTC on Ethereum that was like, you know, custodial stuff like that, you know, but then, you know, then you had, uh, you know, a bunch of different bridges, but now I think, for example, IBC, right, has seen like pretty massive adoption. I, I haven't seen like, I'm not, I haven't really looked at the, the numbers recently. I think, um, yeah, Osmosis did like 120 million IBC volume in the last day. I guess overall 134 million in one day, over 100,000 transactions. So, yeah, I mean, that's right. Because I mean, I remember when it launched and then it was like, you know, a million transactions within like a month very quickly. And now, you know, Osmosis alone doing 100,000 a day. And and so I think IBC is obviously uh, doing tremendously well, right? Getting like a huge amount of uh, adoption. Uh, a lot of new Cosmos chains are launching. And, and I think the, the interesting thing there, right, is that IBC still, you know, IBC is a generalized protocol, right, where you can pass messages and then you can do different things. But like right now, all that's happening is basically uh, token transfers, right? Like nothing, nothing else, right? But the, even now, I think it's, uh, you know, it's now live, right, on the Cosmos Hub, this uh, interchain accounts thing. And the interchain accounts thing is pretty cool, right? Because the interchain accounts basically means that you can have, you know, an account on one chain that's, like, controlled via messages from another chain. So, like, you could imagine, for example, let's say Cosmos Hub um, holding Osmo on osmosis and like staking it or like for example you could have like you know cosmos hub could buy osmosis and like vote in the governance on the osmosis network and uh and that's just one example right i mean i think there's this and, and a quicksilver right that that example right is is where you basically say like okay you're gonna have this one chain that has an account on another chain with, with staking through it, but then issuing a liquid staking asset on, on the host chain. So let's say you have like, uh, let's say Quicksilver uh, staking atoms on the Cosmos hub and then issuing some sort of, you know, Quicksilver atoms, uh, which is another token that basically is similar to the stake ETH in Lido. And, and so I think that's the, 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 use cases that this opens are just going to be mind-blowing uh, actually hard to wrap your head around what exactly will happen i guess it will i mean i remember some years ago there was the web what was it called the, the polka dot conference and then you know someone asked, gavin gave a talk and someone asked uh i think it was dennis from he was at a16c at the time but he asked like what about composability? You know, you have these different parachains and then like, isn't the great advantage of Ethereum, right? You can, you can just build on top of each other. And, uh, you know, somebody builds, you know, stake thief, and then you can put the stake thief into curve and somebody else builds something else on top. And like, how does that work across chains? And until now, it doesn't work so well. But I think we are on the cusp of that starting to work, you know, pretty well. And and maybe one more point on this, like one thing I found super interesting, I recently did a podcast with the Near uh, guys and 
they in their smart contract model actually all of the cross contract interactions they said kind of work in this asynchronous way in the same way that like let's say uh cosmos hub would interact with something on osmosis or something on terra that's how even on the same chain on near like this works and and i think that was like very interesting and it's kind of like uh a good case for just how well that might actually work so i i think this composability thing on being on the same chain is going to be uh it, it's going to look a lot less like a lot less of a advantage i think i mean it's still going to be some advantage but i think it's yeah yeah that near design is, is really cool because i guess in the end the the thing they're trying to solve was that people would want to be on the same shard as, as some popular application and everything crowds there because it's faster, right? So you avoid having that, which which I also find pretty interesting. And I guess, yeah, nowadays there are a lot of solutions. I mean, IBC stands out because actually, yeah, like you said, it's a protocol. It's very trustless or trust minimized, I guess, um, versus I think on the other hand, we have kind of other things emerging also like i guess it, it there's a spectrum always right but I, I found it very interesting from terra from the start uh kind of trailblazer in that space um initially with the terra shuttle bridge which was very very centralized and then but like starting to get assets from other chains into terra to kind of supplement this anchor yield right uh, initially i guess a eth uh, so b eth and um now, uh, for example, also be sold soon, where they actually switched also the bridges from that Terra bridge to Wormhole, which is at least, I guess, um, another, it's another protocol. It's, it's again, another network in and of itself, uh, but I guess it's more decentralized than having one and then IBC or like other protocols like this being being like the ultimate maybe solution of, of, of the good thing about wormhole is also that it has an insurance fund <laughs> yeah IBC <laughs> has uh, unpaid relayers that, <laughs> that <don't laughs> yeah so yeah I guess yeah a lot of things are happening and 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 sometimes you know the bridges are I guess slower than the demand for um, cross-chain applications and I think that's what Terra realized very well or like trusted collateral and um, they really, that's, that's, I think a big part of why it became so, um, yeah, popular right now is like, so dominating so much because yeah, they really like, uh, after cross chain, bringing both UST to other chains, but also bring collateral from other chains to Terra itself. So, I, uh, it's really fascinating to see, see what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, I think it's a good point, right? Cause in a way, I think Terra is like the most advanced cross-chain application even even something like osmosis okay like i mean you have a lot of other assets coming onto osmosis you trade them but like actually terra has a lot more sophisticated use cases right where you have the uh you know you see going elsewhere and i think there are i i i'm personally i mean there's a lot, a lot of like questions around UST often how sustainable is it and but I think it is a I think it's absolutely brilliant strategy to use other crypto assets as like you know some kind of backing in in addition to Luna so that you have both the the scalability of being able to like increase the UST supply fast but you have this like decentralized kind of asset pool backing it and I think if you if you think of like the if you think of just the how massive this use case is of like a decentralized stable coin, which is an enormous use case, right? So I I think yeah, I think it's it's very cool and yeah, still terrible confirmed. <laughs> yeah, I think personally, yeah, I'm I it's it's a great strategy. And I think the one thing where I what I would find cool because in the end now it's a lot reliant on like the the assets that come from the other chains are through wormhole uh, mostly, and I think that's also like a big risk of course to to anchor if if there is something really goes wrong, 
Um, that could also be a problem. And, and I guess that's where the interchain accounts kind of come in because in the end, ideally Terra could use that and, and have like Cosmos assets or IBC enabled assets there. And maybe they have like a little bit or like at least diversify the bridges. I think that that would be cool, but ultimately like have a bridge that is probably um, like, yeah, IBC based. And obviously Terra is built on the Cosmos SDK, so it should be possible. I, I guess I don't know exactly the details, but um I would find that pretty cool, and, and I hope uh, someone in Terra is looking at that too. Yeah, I, I think this is the other thing that has been like, I think that's interesting about bridges, right? Where to me, it seems like you have two very different uh, approaches, right? Like you have IBC, basically you have like a light client on each side, and then, you know, you can just uh, put assets in between. And of course, the nice thing is that, you know, the Cosmos Hub validators, for example, they don't also have to run a validator on, you know, some other chain. Nobody has to basically do anything on the other chain and you still can have this connection between the other chains. So it's like, you know, very permissionless, very open, like, uh, you know, fantastic model uh, and working super well. But of course, the big downside is you have to have that light client and the light client works well in, you know, between Cosmos SDK chain kind of comes out of the box, but then you try to do that with, I don't know, Ethereum or like a lot of other chains, Solana, and it's super hard. Actually, we did a bunch of work, of course, one right to basically do this kind of cello Cosmos and building, you know, Cosmos like kind and Solidity and, you know, it kind of worked, but it was, you know, very challenging and and I think that's where you have to, the power of something like, you know, the wormhole of Axelar, where you have, you know, a central set of actors who can like run lots of different chains. And then, uh, yeah, and of course you don't have the path dependence either, right? So that's something they get there. So I think in the end, both of them are going to be like huge success. I think both approaches. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's even like... I guess even more approaches with the optimistic nomad design, which is like yeah, somewhere I don't in between. That one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't make me try to explain it. But <laughs> I guess yeah. I mean, in in general, I think yeah, definitely been the, I guess the hot topic in the last few months or actually even weeks. This bridge interoperability, um, and and will remain so and. Um, I guess IBC is still kind of under the radar in, in the in the wider sense. I mean, we were also at the Avalanche um, conference, um, and of course we have uh, some big Avalanche fans in, in Chorus One. But uh, I guess there also it was you know there's the subnets which is kind of similar to the Cosmos zones, and then there's also supposed to be a interoperability protocol, but it's kind of not there yet, of course. And IBC is there is being used today. Um, I guess there then there. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes, and even maybe how how the interoperability between because I guess between finality, fast finality chains, the the IBC connection should be easier. This like client design, so I guess more chains could that have that could adopt IBC. Um, but yeah, I guess it's always like the thing with standards that <laughs> uh, you have to convince people to use yours. Yeah, no, I I do think that makes sense, right? So. I definitely think IBC will spread uh, beyond uh, Cosmos SDK networks, but of course, it's it's it is always it's never going to be a solution for like connecting to Bitcoin or uh, you know various different networks. Okay, so uh, the other thing I wanted to maybe final topic I wanted to touch on is sort of the topic of crypto markets. Now, this is something we like hardly ever talk about uh, on this podcast, and also something like I, I don't feel I have, you know, like great insights in. I'm basically always optimistic, <laughs> <and> always <laughs> thinks, always think things are going to be fine, and then like you know, in retrospect, I can look back on like 2018 and it's like should have been obvious that this was like. A bubble. Iron hands. Uh, I mean, kind of, kind of, rec kind of recognized it, but like, but then I was, now, of course, we do have, 
interesting times, right? Like in the world. So maybe, and you know, what, what are the interesting times? Probably the most interesting one, I think the most interesting aspect may be inflation. No, because I think that's, I mean, maybe there's, you know, the one is this monetary tightening, right? That like you've had for many, many years, you had like central banks, you know, like issue, uh, uh, you know, basically increase the money supply. And then of course, what happens with all the money, like that has to go somewhere, goes to buy up assets as the prices go up. And, uh, you know, it's interesting if you think of real estate, right? Like if, if you're like in a real estate investor, then probably your entire investment career, like the 30 years, let's say you, you've been around for a long time, right? You've been investing for 30 years. You, you spend the entire 30 years investing in an environment where basically interest rates were going down. And of course, if interest rates are going down, then it means that if you just do this like discounted cash flow, right? You take all the future income streams and you take and you basically uh, say, what's the present value of those future streams? If, if the interest rates is lower, the value of the streams in the future is, is goes up. And so I guess you had this situation that basically because of the changing interest rates, you kind of were bound to have continuously increasing prices. I think we're so like used to this. And like, I mean, who remembers like times of high inflation? Like, I mean, that was in the 80s, right? In the 80s, you had like high inflation in... And so now it's weird, right? Now we all of a sudden having a higher inflation, having this monetary tightening. Of course, you have the whole war and Russia and stuff. So, and I was, I was reading like Arthur Hayes, you know, he wrote uh, a great post, a fantastic writer. So the, you know, the BitMEX, um, BitMEX founder, you know, he was, he was basically being very bearish, right? He was like, Hey, it's, uh, I think for other reasons as well, but so it's just, I mean, like thinking a little bit about, you know, what is this interplay between this macroeconomics and crypto? And what is it going to mean for crypto markets? Is like a bear market ahead or, or maybe not? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, <laughs> I guess we come to the section where we uh, predict the prices. <laughs> um, yeah, what's the Bitcoin price on uh, on New Year's Eve? <laughs> I I can only, I guess I'll, I'll say that, I mean, for the longest time, right, there was this scenario that like everything will crash it's been around for a while i guess now we're at a point where we also have this war on top of everything and i guess we had COVID. i guess that was also already the first time where we thought maybe now everything's falling apart and this asset bubble is crashing now it's kind of the war but who knows if it's actually going to happen and and then i guess the, the second thing let's say if, if we come from that what what is happening to crypto when that happens like for the longest time, right? It also at some point the 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 narrative was that yeah, Bitcoin is this hedge against the other assets because if that fails, then everyone will flee to Bitcoin as the safe haven. I would actually say I think if this all collapses, then probably it will still also mean Bitcoin and, and crypto would would also uh, collapse and wouldn't be that crypto does good in these times. So. I think it will still be correlated then in, in terms of like, you know, is is this the mania over or <laughs> can we further increase everything? I, I guess I, I don't have a good opinion on that and on what time frame that is or what's the, are we in a, in, in a world where it just keeps going like this or does it have to fall apart at some point? Yeah. I mean, I think you, you of course do have a bunch of, uh, trends that are like very bullish crypto and they're not stopping right like i think first of all you just have the advance of the technology and you know like i mean we talked about a bunch of stuff right like this proof of stake interoperability like so many other things nfts user experience everything's getting better scalability right scalability is getting soft i think right it's pretty clear uh like so you can have like abundance of cheap transactions so 
all of those things are progressing and there's so much money in the space there's so much funding that even if there is like a pretty uh dramatic bear even if there is a big crash it may slow down things a little bit but it's still going to progress right because also many companies right in the crypto space they have I mean, all the exchanges, right? They have like huge, more money than you can ever spend. And many startups have raised so much money. So I think that's just progressing, right? And then I also think mainstream adoption, uh, you know, we have seen NFTs, right? Bringing in lots of users. And and I think that's also going to kind of continue, right? With like new new user experiences, new, new maybe games. Like, I don't think that's going to... Stop. Even if the market goes down, right? I still think you're going to see more people doing something crypto related. And then the institutional adoption, right? We talked a little bit about it, right? So, okay, it's very slow. But of course, the, I think the flip side of that is also that it may take these institutions like a very long time to decide to do something crypto. Or then it takes them a long time to like move. They move slowly. But they're not going to just stop, right? They're going to... I think they might slow down how much money they put in. Yeah, there's also like, I guess they have certain, you know, you have a fund that has that many millions that you kind of need to deploy and then maybe they would continue that or they it just takes so long that, yeah, I guess there will be continuous stream coming in, maybe not as big or... That was an, actually, I saw some person tweet, so unfortunately I don't remember who that was, so can't can can't uh, give credit here but and shout him out <laughs> yeah but uh, basically you know kind of pointing that out right just like how much money has been raised by you know like crypto vc funds or crypto investment funds to like be deployed and of course that's going a lot into you know these private funding rounds and of course you're seeing private funding rounds and like you know huge valuations like raising lots and lots of money you know everyone's raising money and I mean, that does mean, I guess, that you're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, funds being deployed. But at the same time, it was also sort of the point was, okay, but who's going to be, like, where does the demand come from afterwards, right? Because, like, okay, money goes in, they build something, they go live, now there's some tro token trading. And, like, who's buying that token, right? For in the end, to generate the return for these investors, they need to go up like, you know, 10 times, or five liquidity. times. Or, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess that reminds you a little bit maybe of the 2017, 18 thing, right? Where there's also like a lot of money going into these ICO projects and then, you know, they maybe came out, but then there was like nobody there to buy it. Yeah. I, I think the question is just, yeah, where are you in, are we in this cycle, right? I guess, is it already... Is, or is there still like another wave coming? I do think it, the, na the nature of this markets is that it like creates exuberance and it goes too far. So I was reading uh, this newsletter from Dan Moorhead and, you know, he was pointing out where they use some sort of, I don't know what it is, like some kind of, you know, moving average thing progressing, you know, going to the moon over time and then seeing like where we are compared to this, you know, inevitable a rainbow uh, chart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, the, yeah, it's basically like the rainbow chart. Uh, and, you know, saying like, okay, if you look at that, right, we're like, you know, 56% underneath the, you know, trend line. So this is like cheapest, cheapest ever, kind of, right? So I guess that's, uh, so it's definitely not a phase of like crazy exuberance, right? That's, that's pretty clear. I mean, I guess in terms of like, I guess there's, there was this Vitalik post once, right? Like crypto markets are at this point, have we earned it or something? I mean, it's very hard for me to like kind of put into context how much of it is like actual value and, and or like sustainable, obviously it's kind of not sustainable, some things. And, and yeah, where's the exuberance? When is the point where it's gotten too far? Um, it doesn't feel like it right now. <laughs> I mean... Uh, maybe that's that's why it is the case. I guess that's that's always the problem with with these with these things. But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't have too much alpha to leak here um, today. 
Cool. All right, then. Well, thanks so much, Felix. That was fun. Enjoyed this conversation. And thanks so much for... Yeah, thanks for having me. Didn't expect to be on, on Epicenter that soon. I, I didn't even build anything. <laughs> no, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. And uh, yeah, looking forward to um, yeah what's to come. And uh, yeah, see you tomorrow at work. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for our listeners for tuning in. Let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, you can uh, tweet at us at epicenter VTC. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. We'll see you next week.